will be glorified in this service. Power fall. It is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And amen. Bless him. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You can give him applause. You can wave your hand. You can you can send out a shout. You can very grateful for your heart this morning, your commitment to engage the presence of the Lord. My silence is not because I'm trying to figure out what to do. Um, my silence is because I'm trying to figure out what not to do. Because in moments like this, oftentimes human beings get in the way of what God wants to do. The most uncomfortable thing is to be still and to wait on God. But if you'll do me a favor while I continue to listen to the Holy Ghost, is go to Genesis chapter 32. Pastor Anzio, pray for me. I feel something in here. I feel like God is about to do something I haven't seen before. It's funny because you never know when he's going to show up. We try to formulate and hypothesize, somehow assume that we can get ahead of God and God will show up in a regular 830 service in a small town. And And shake a whole world. I think he's about to do it right here. Genesis 32. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I should be thin. I should have no fat on me. Because I've been running my whole life. I should get an Olympic medal and an Oscar at the same time because I put the face on of joy when the enemy was whooping on my head. But I wasn't sure who to be vulnerable in front of because some people actually won't help when they see. They'll celebrate. And leaders have to be careful where they bleed. And I'm speaking to you because I believe that each one of you has been gifted with a measure of influence. And I want to encourage you to be wise where you share your broken places. I've been running. Whoever that is on the kingdom kids, go get your kid. Lay in there. <laughs> throwing their diaper around, go get your, go get your little batch. <laughs> I was trying to be real deep. The Lord was like, bring it on back, son. Bring it on back. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a point where you just have to face some things. And it's very uncomfortable. And God makes it that way because 
God's intention in maturing us was never convenience or comfort. It's always to manifest calling. It's very quiet in this wonderful building this morning. I want you to hear me when I say this, that God is not obligated to your comfort. He is obligated to the calling that's on your life. And oftentimes the calling on your life is produced out of tension, opposition, being uncomfortable, obstacles, things that we don't like in our westernized society, in a microwave society where you can have everything you want in a few moments. You can't microwave maturity. You cannot drive through spiritual relevance. You can't just go through the drive through The Holy Ghost is not taking your order. Jacob, in Genesis 32, was a track star. He had been running his whole life. I wonder how many track stars we have here and those who are watching in our relentless online family track stars we know god was saying i need you to face this and it starts as a whisper then it gets a little louder over time because we refuse to lock in and so we fill ourselves with things activities to fill the void that that distance between what we hear god saying and what we know God wants to do and the convenience and the comfort that we want to remain in and the familiarity of what is convenient is stopping what God is calling. God wants to mature his church. Whole cities are being burned up in a day. Well, I guess I'll go over here. Entire cities in this nation are being burned up in a day. The world is on fire, and half the church is asleep, waiting on somebody else to do what the Lord said we were supposed to do. Be the light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But we don't want the light on because we're not sure if we got roaches on the floor. Whether you have spiritual challenges or not is not the issue because we all have them. The issue is, are you going to do what he told you in spite of your deficiencies? If he was looking for perfect, he sure would have overlooked me. And he certainly would have overlooked you. But he's not looking over you. He's not looking past you. He's looking at you. And there's nothing more uncomfortable when somebody stares at you. You ever been somewhere in a public place and somebody just... And your response is, what you looking at? Anybody ever said, who's ever said, what, what are you looking at? You know what's deep? It's deeper than just the words, what you looking at, which by the way is not a word, but it's a phrase, but you get it. The reason why people are uncomfortable when, when somebody is staring at them is because they feel naked. They're not even doing it. They're just looking at you, but you're uncomfortable because the eyes are the window to the soul and you wonder what they can see. And then sometimes it's actually the question, what are you looking at? What you're actually saying is, tell me who I am. What are you looking at? Tell me what you're looking at. Tell me what you see so I can know what to do. Tell me who I am. And God is saying, I'm coming to look at you face to face. I want you to see yourself through my lens. It's an uncomfortable truth, and we run. Jacob had been running for as long as he could remember. The title of my message is Running From My Life. Running from your life. Running from your life. You ever heard somebody say, run for your life? 
a lot of us are running from our lives. Oh, it's quiet in this place this morning, but I'm going to preach it. Genesis 32, starting at the 22nd verse. Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over. Somebody say cross over. The ford Yabok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone. And this is where I get stuck. I've been preaching this. I've been preaching this. I've been preaching this. But I'm, I'm struggling with this scripture, and I'm hoping somebody at this service can help me. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, I always said this was an angel or an angel of the Lord or a pre-incarnate Jesus. But scripture clearly says, what does it say? Amen. Say it again. Amen. Now, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. I want to know how I miss this. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he, there's a lowercase and an uppercase. When he saw that he did not prevail against him, lowercase, he, uppercase, touched the socket of his, lowercase, hip. And the socket of Jacob, so now we know that the lowercase was Jacob, and the uppercase was this man. When you introduce yourself to somebody and you introduce yourself by your name, you always capitalize your name. You're getting ready to go somewhere. He said, let me go for the day breaks, but he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, there's a boy, there's a man. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled. I only want to preach to people who have struggled. You have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob said, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? My name is inconsequential. And he blessed him there. He blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Penai, Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Running from your life. There came a moment in Jacob's life when he could no longer run. He had to face the uncomfortable truth about who he was, what he had done, the life he had lived, and what God was calling him to do. Now, I believe that Jacob was not just wrestling with God. You can't, the Bible says no man has seen God and lit. Nobody has, no one has seen God at any time. Can I get an amen? This is scripture. Even the seraphim that are in the presence of God cover their eyes. They cover their face with wings. Now they know they're in the presence of the Most High God by declaring holy, holy, holy. But they haven't seen him, which is very important because you can know you're in the presence of God and not see him. Stop waiting on some divine vision and open my eyes. God's like, it's actually better if you keep your eyes closed. He's real. I don't have to understand it all to know that he's calling me. It's called faith for a reason, and it's not faith if you can see it. For too long, we've been walking around with our eyes wide open. That's why we don't see miracles. We don't see the signs and wonders because you're not going to see them with the naked eye. You're going to see them through the eyes of faith. And God has been stirring in this church and stirring around the nation a, 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 a generation of people that says, God, I know that I have not faced the uncomfortable things, but now I must go ahead and turn around and stop running for once in my life, and I must address the things that do not feel good. Has anybody ever had to face something they didn't want to face? One of us, two of us, ten of us. I found myself battling with, with how much of myself I wanted to share in this message because the Lord doesn't let me preach messages for y'all that don't hit me first. And I think that should be the mark of any pastor 
that if I'm not vulnerable, I can't expect you to be vulnerable, and I'm not asking you to be vulnerable to me, but there are people that you're called to reach, and they will be moved by your transparency and your vulnerability. Been running my whole life, been running from self-hatred, been running from insecurity, been running from fear. I, I wake up many, many days scared, scared, because I have to face the responsibility and the weight of souls. It's not easy. I'm, I'm like, God is saying, yeah, and I'm not changing my mind. And I've been trying to run. I've, I've run since I was probably 12 years old, 13, when I knew that I was called. I was, Lord, I'm going to be a lawyer. He's like, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was going to do good. I was going to make money. I was going to have a nice house. Or I was going to teach, you know, be a professor. And God said, no, I'm calling you to preach. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want. Anybody else God just wouldn't leave you alone? Where the people God doesn't leave alone? 17 of us. I don't know what I feel in here. Is, is, is it just that everybody's locked in and listening? calling he had a promise the problem is he put his hands on his promise before God was finished with the process many of us have a promise but we put our hands on the process get your hands off of it tell somebody get your hands off of it the prophecy was before he was born two nations are in your womb and the older shall serve the younger. That was a prophecy over Jacob and Esau. But the mother was like, this is not working out the way I thought. It looks like Esau's gonna get the blessing, so I need to put my hands on. on it. And what it ended up doing is damaging and separating this family and causing a level of anger and hatred between brothers where Esau wanted to kill Jacob and Esau could do it because Esau was that dude. He was the hunter gatherer while Jacob was the fixer upper sitting in the house cooking meals and washing dishes. He was the mama's boy and Esau was that man's man. Harry never shaved, just walking around smelling like all day while Jacob was in there smelling like fresh flowers, picking flowers for the centerpiece of the table. And so instead of fighting Esau straight up because he knew he couldn't win that way, he did what any real self-respect dude would do. He ran. I found myself always running from battles, Kells. I run. And then God said, you know what? You 45 and you need to stop running. And it's so interesting that what Relentless Church represents for me is me running from the fullness of what God called me to. Because for many years, I was able to serve the vision of other people and serve at the request of other men of God. And I did so with everything I had in me because I believe in honor. I believe in service. And God was like, I'm teaching you something for later. I'm like, no, it's no later. I'm just going to do this. I don't have to do anything else. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'll just serve right here. And God's like, I'm teaching you something. I'm like, ah, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. Let me just serve. And God's like, no. And then what he did, what he did is I got a phone call last October from this man of God and he's sitting there all straight back and most straight back man I ever seen in my life he ain't got no curve just sitting there just straight back man of God are you sitting down God is calling me to another place I need to make sure that the sheep are covered before I do what the Lord is telling me to do I'm like sure I'll uproot my regularly scheduled life and my nice house and my wife and kids. And I'll come to Greenville where I don't know anybody, but I love the people. I like the trees and there's probably not a lot of traffic. Then I get here and Woodruff Road is a parking lot. Get on my nerve. Lawrence Road parking lot. 385 traffic jam. 85. Are you kidding me, Jesus? I could have stayed in the big city with a bigger mall. Haywood Mall. Cheesecake Factory. Jesus. Really?
Do you know that the Lord told me just enough to get me to move? I'm getting ready to help somebody. He's never going to tell you everything. He's only going to tell you enough to get you out of your comfort zone. He's only going to tell you enough to get you out of the safe place. Because if you stayed where you were, you wouldn't be everything he's calling you to be. You'd never become what he intended for you to be. And so safe feels good and comfort feels good, but it is antithetical to the fullness of what God has called you to. Stop running from your life. I need to give somebody eight seconds to give God a praise right there. And the posture you take when God shifts you will determine how fast you get to where he's calling you. Did you hear what I said? The posture that you take, because you can have an attitude. See, here's my thing. When my kids, when I tell my kids to do something, if I hear, what? What, what is, you don't pay any bills in here. You don't, you do what I say. But if I hear, yes, sir. Oh, well, yeah, you can watch TV. See, because I know what they don't know. I see what my kids don't see. So their posture, because they're going to do it anyway. I'm trying to help you. Because some of y'all still struggling like you actually have a choice. Do you know your calling is bigger than your will? Your calling is bigger than what you want because there are souls hanging in the balance of your obedience. Oh, obedience brings the audience, not your talent, not your gift. So you can run all you want. You can't run away from God. You can only run into God. Jacob had been running his whole life. And God will tell you just enough to get you to the place where then you have to face what you never faced. And it's not just Jacob. Talk to me, Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose. I love this. I like Jonah. He's my kind of guy. He arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He tried to run from the presence of God. How you going to run from the God that's in everything? He's every. That's you just you run from this part of God to this part of God. That's funny. Why I have to put my own stomach out there though. Anyway. I'm running from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found the ship going to Tarshish and he paid the fare. Be careful. Be careful when you run because you're going to pay for it. And he went down because anytime you run from God, you're going to go down. He didn't go up. He went down in it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's just stay right there. Jonah had a calling. Jonah had an unenviable calling. He had to go to Nineveh and he had to preach against the city. He did not want to go preach against the city. He wanted to do his own thing. And here's what's deep. If you've read the book of Jonah, and Bishop, tell me if I'm right, because at the end of this entire uh, book, we find out that Jonah was actually upset with God because he said, God, you're so merciful, you're going to forgive these people. And I actually don't want to see them forgiven. Because they've hurt me, they've hurt our people. These are not Jews. These were not believers. So why are you telling me to tell them to repent, let them die in their sins? They have hurt us, they've hurt me, and I know enough about you that if I open my mouth and tell them how good you are, they're going to turn. And I don't want them to turn. Some of y'all are running from your calling because you don't want to see God bless the people he's assigned you to. Ooh. 
Jonah said, I'm not going. I'm going to get on this boat. The love boat. So we'll be making another run. He gets in the boat. And the Bible says God sent a wind. I don't care how fast you're running away. He will send a wind. You know, the Holy Spirit is the wind. The Holy Spirit has been whispering to some of y'all. Who am I talking to? Your calling is calling you. One person. Okay. Your calling is calling you. And you can't run anymore from the thing you were created for. Yes, I know you like that job. That job is just a part of your calling. It's not the totality of your calling. I know you like where you are. That's not all God has for you. You try if you might, but you can't run. God keeps messing with you early in the morning, late at night. He's been trying to lovingly get your attention. And I'm telling you, if you don't respond right now, he's going to send a wind. Because some of y'all have about six weeks, six and a half weeks, because God is determined to get glory out of your life because 2019 is when you walk into the fullness of who you're called to be. And so he's been trying to wake you up in this last part of the year, shake you up. Am I talking to anybody other than me? Because elevation is coming so fast, you won't have time to get ready then. You got to get ready right now. Lord, you got to help me running from my life. He didn't want to preach it because he knew God was going to cause people that he didn't like to get saved, to come into this place called repentance. And there are things that God wants to confront in each of us so that we can be who he's created us to be. Write this down. Confrontation precedes elevation. Confrontation precedes elevation. You're not going where God wants you to go until you face the thing you've been unwilling to face. I don't know what it is in your life. For me, it's fear. I'm going to just tell you flat out, I, I'm scared a lot. I'm scared because I don't want to fail God. I want to serve God, but I want to serve God. I was content to serve God in a place with no internet. I didn't need any cameras. I could preach. I could pastor. I could pastor a church in the country somewhere. I didn't need this. I told God, I don't need a big church. I don't need a platform. There are some people, no lie, I know preachers that walk around with like makeup on just for no reason. Like just in case there's a camera, like they ready. I'm like, that's weird. Like, dude, you're not on TV all the time. Stop it. I stay ashy. You know why? Because... I'm not looking for TV cameras. I'm not looking for an arena. I'm called to this, but I don't have to have this. I'm going to stay right there, Pastor Jermaine. And what God does in the process is he burns out ambition. So when you get to the place of your planting, you won't need it more than it needs you. But you're going to have to stop running from the issues of your life. You're going to have to run. You're going to have to stop running from the, the insecurities and the prejudices and the prejudgmental ideologies you have about people. Nobody wants to talk about that. But this country is still divided based on what you see when you look at people. I'm a good man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, but if I get pulled over by a police, I'm nervous. Not because I did anything wrong, but because I know that some officers don't see a pastor or a husband or a father or a, or a minister or somebody who supports firefighters, police, and veterans. What they see is the accumulated dialogue about black men before they see me. They don't see my spirit first. They see my color first. And God is saying, 
whether it's someone in law enforcement or in ministry or in business, he's going to make you face the uncomfortable things that you think about people before he sends you to the next place. In fact, he'll make you face the thing that you're prejudiced about to let you see who you really are while you shouting Jesus on one hand and holding this stuff in your heart on the other hand. Running from your life. Let me make this clear. This is not about uh, one individual thing because prejudice comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Get that right. I know what the narrative is out there, but Jonah had a problem with the Ninevites, and that was, that was uh, national. It was racial. He didn't like that these people that didn't come from his side of the tracks were getting ready to get saved. He didn't like it. He, he was uncomfortable with it. Oh, boy. Why are you talking about this? Because we're still in the South. And we're going to have a church that honors everybody. I don't care who you are or where you come from. We're not going to run from it. We're going to talk about it. Did you hear what I said? We're not running from it. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to disrespect people that we don't agree with. We're going to lay down our politics at that door. We're going to love Jesus in here. Did you hear what I said? Don't ask me who I voted for. That's none of your business, and I won't ask you. But I will ask you, do you love Jesus? And if you say yes, then we got something in common. I'm not going to run from the uncomfortable thing. I'm going to face it. The truth is, I'm a black man preaching in a mixed church. And that is not something that happens in America. So instead of running from it, let me face it, because I've been places where like, I don't see color. Well, I hope you do, because until you do, you don't see what God made. And if I look at you and say, I don't see your white skin, then that dishonors who God made you. Each one of us has been made by God for a purpose. And the truth is, Relentless Church is supposed to be a big, fat, black eye to all of the uncomfortable things going on out there. The all-black church over there and the all-white church over there. And they both sing in the same songs but won't speak to each other. It's all about Jesus, boy. I said, it's all about Jesus. And stop running from your life because this is the life we have. This is the community we've been given. This is the ministry that we've been called to. A ministry of reconciliation. And Jonah ran from reconciliation. That's why God had a fish swallow him and deliver him to his destiny. I need some help over here because y'all real quiet over there. How y'all doing? Tell somebody, you're going to get to your calling. Even if it stinks. Josh, he didn't want to listen. So he, he what? this is why you've got to do what God called you to do. If you don't get in place, you're putting people around you in danger. I don't know what was on the other side of my no, but I knew God told me to get to Greenville. I don't know why. I believe that this is the next place that God has. There are other things that God wants to do, but if I didn't do this first, he couldn't trust me with whatever's coming after that. And if I had said no to that, I guarantee you I would have still ended up here. I just wouldn't have been smelling good when I got here. Because disobedience leaves a stench. So the Bible says that the people were about to die. Jonah said, I'm the reason this is happening. Throw me overboard. Be gentle though, but just throw me over there. It's funny because I believe Jonah actually didn't mind dying. Because to him, death was better than obedience. Some of y'all would rather die on the vine than do the thing God created you to do. I want you to know God is so much God, he's laughing at your attempts at spiritual suicide. You're going to try to end your destiny, and while you jumping, it's going to be a fish there to swallow it. 
I know some of y'all don't believe in the Bible. I believe that a fish swallowed a man. I still believe that a virgin had a baby. I believe a dead man got up three days later and I believe he's coming back. I believe the Bible. I'm not running from that. You want me to try to act like it's normal? No, none of this is normal. All of it's crazy. But so is healing. So is miracles. So is getting free from cancer. So is getting up out of a wheelchair. And if I'm going to believe one part, I might as well believe all of it. Stop running from it. Run to it. He was not going, Pastor Daniel, to Nineveh. He was going in the opposite direction, and God told a fish, see that man, swallow him. Watch this. Consume him, but don't digest him. So I wish I, ooh, I wish I had an organ, right? I got an organ, but he too busy shouting. He missed it. See, because it should have consumed you and digested you. But God said, no, I just want you to carry it. The thing that should have swallowed you whole was actually just keeping you. <laughs> keeping you whole. Oh, help me, God. I don't know what it smells like to be inside of a fish. But I've been to Pike Place, Pike Street Fish Market up in Seattle. That's a smell you don't want in your house. He was in the belly of a fish for three days. And then on the third day, the fish had indigestion. I don't care how much you're running. I don't care how far you're running away from the thing you're called to. God is getting ready to send something to swallow you and push you in the direction and spit you out on the shore of your calling. The Bible says... Spit him up, and where was he? <laughs> like, I, was, I thought I was going to die. He didn't even kill me. Let this fish carry me for three days. He ended up where God intended for him to be, late and stinking, when he could have been in there <laughs> smelling fresh and clean, clean. So I want to tell you, stop resisting the direction of God on your life because he's going to get you there because it's not about you. It's about the people that are assigned to your life. The only reason I'm alive is because my assignment is not up. When my assignment is up, my breath will leave. But I'm not dying until then and neither are you. And neither are you. I need somebody to get this in your spirit. Stop worrying about all this stuff going on. You're going to live until your purpose is complete. You're going to have to wrestle with the uncomfortable things. Somebody say wrestle. Jacob said, I'm tired of running. He just turned around and faced himself. He let go of everything else and he finally wrestled. And it says he wrestled with a man. I'm going to have to deal with this at the next service. He wrestled with a man. Well, was it God? No, it says a man. So who was it? Who was he wrestling? Somebody tell me. It doesn't say he was wrestling with Yeshua. It doesn't say he was wrestling. He can't wrestle with God. I mean, God would, would have killed the boy. He ain't wrestling. Well, who was he wrestling with? Say it again. He was wrestling with the nation that had to be birthed at that moment. The uncomfortable places in your life right now are because there's a nation trying to get out of you. Israel said, I can't stay in here any longer. Let's fight. There's a part of you that's emerging, that's warring against the you that you've always known. And that's why you can't sleep. And that's why people are getting on your nerves. And that's why your ears are more sensitive. And that's why food doesn't taste good. And that's why the relationships aren't working out. And that's why your job doesn't give you the same satisfaction and fulfillment. Because God is saying it's time for you to face you. And it's time for you to wrestle you. And whoever lives is the one I intended. But it's time for you to fight. I feel like I'm hitting up against something in the spirit.
Jacob wrestled. He wrestled all night. And then he said, let me go for the day breaks. He said, no, no, I done been through too much. You got to bless me. He says, what's your name? Mm, Jacob. Mm. No, not anymore. Finally, now that you faced it, the nation can emerge. The power of engagement is the power to birth a nation. God wants you to face the uncomfortable thing and stop running so what is called out of you can be birthed. There are people waiting on your obedience, waiting on your yes, waiting on you to address the uncomfortable areas of your life so that they can come into these doors. There's not a lack of people. That's not why these pews are empty. It's because we haven't done the things we need to do. Because the day you wake up to the fullness of your calling, you won't be able to keep your mouth closed about Jesus. You'll tell the whole world. I'm not running anymore. I'm going to face the uncomfortable things. And I'm going to do the, un, the, the uncomfortable things so I can be who God has created me to be. In these last few weeks of the year, I want you to do some self-assessment. Take a look at your life. Take a look at how you see people. Do you filter people through their mistakes and their brokenness or through their behavior? Are you black and you see people through the lens of color? Are you black and see all white people as bad? Are you white and see all black people as bad? Are you Hispanic and see people from different races as bad? Or do you engage each individual as they are? Because all people that have the same look don't think the same way. They don't come from the same place. So I better get to know you one-on-one. -on -one. Can I get an amen? Matter of fact, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go introduce yourself to somebody that doesn't look like you. And they might not be on your road. Take a second. Get uncomfortable. Go introduce yourself to someone. Get up. Shake a hand. Introdu ask them their name. Stop running from what we are. We are a multicultural, multi-generational, multi-denominational, come from different places, Jesus-loving church. Worship team, come on up here. While you're doing that, what we just did is we broke the back of the devil because we're not going to be divided. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to live in an uncomfortable community where we don't address the reality that we don't look the same, but we love the same Jesus. We all love Jesus. We all love barbecue. We all love sweet tea. We got a lot in common. Let's stop running from what we are. Let's face what it is. We've had a very uncomfortable history in this nation of not dealing with things. Your pastor has brown skin. But take this skin off and take yours off. We got the same everything else. Same heart, same lungs, same kidneys, same God, same church. So I break racism in half right here this morning. And I bind every effort of the devil to keep us separated. This is us. This is the life we live. This is the calling we have. Let's wrestle. Let's become a nation. Let's show the world how it's done. Let's build bridges. Let's live in community. Let's fight for one another. Let's live a life worthy of the blood that was shed for us. Lord Jesus, I pray for my church, for the beautiful souls, because souls don't have a color. 
Boy, I wish we'd catch that one, Elder. I said, souls don't have a color. Jesus said there's no marrying or entering into marriage in heaven. So souls don't have a gender either. I know that's going to mess with people. Well, what are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is everybody can walk through the doors. Let the Holy Ghost deal with the heart. Father, this is the church that I always wanted to see. A church where people could come in. Those who may not have a lot of money, and some people do have a lot of money. The man who won the lottery, he's in here today. I just was messing with y'all, make sure y'all was, he was like, where is he? Is he single? Jesus, my husband is here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my. <laughs> I'm just saying, unless you are, is you here? I love you. I love your whole family. Relentless Church, R-E-L-E-N-T-S, Relentless, R-E-L-E-N-T, Less. <laughs> I'm going to cry, and it's because I'm filled up. Because I don't have a, I don't know how much longer I have on the earth, but I'm not going to waste one Sunday Every Sunday is going to count. And here's how I make it count. By building bridges, fighting for souls, and honoring people. That's what we're going to be about. If there's any pastor or leader who's been offended by me at any point in my life, forgive me. And I forgive those who have hurt me, who have been purposeful in trying to harm me. I release you this morning. For the spirit of racism that has existed over the church, we don't run from it. We face it and declare that we know that it's real, but it can't stay here. Did y'all hear what I said? Father, bless this church and these people in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus, or you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, or you want to be a member of Relentless Church, get all of your things, get all of your things, your Bible, your coat, and I want you to come to the front of this altar. You have exactly 30 seconds. I want you to run. If you know that this is home, if you know God is calling you home, I want you to come on. Hurry up. We've been waiting on you. Why? There he is. There he is. I've been waiting on you. There he is. That's right. Bring your babe. Bring her.